talking about really focusing in on some of our intervention work today, talking about um, how we can improve transition outcomes by supporting families. And for a long time, when we thought about autistic individuals, this is who we tended to think about, right? We tended to think about young children, uh, mostly boys, children who are white. Um, and for a long time, our research reflected that bias. And, and, we, and we learned a lot about young children on the autism spectrum. Now, that has been really important. And this knowledge that we've gained about understanding how to diagnose autism, understanding how to provide supports to young children has been, we, we've, we've learned a lot. And it's been a really, really important area to study and understand. But more recently, and within the last 10 years really, I think we've come to really understand that children with autism grow up to become adults with autism, right? And we're starting to see, you know, at first I felt like we were seeing a lot of popular press stories about the challenges that autistic youth and adults face during the transition to adulthood and beyond, really shining a light on this issue. We still see a lot of those stories, but now I feel like what we're thinking about and hearing about when we think about autism and adulthood is a lot more diverse. We still hear a lot about the challenges and the ways that people might struggle in terms of employment or the transition to adulthood. We also hear a lot about different strengths that autistic people may bring to the table in different contexts. And we hear a lot, too, about different programs and different ways that we can support autistic individuals either in college or work or, or other programs, too. But regardless, we've seen a lot more interest and in, in, in really sort of focus in the popular press on autism past early childhood. We've also seen a lot more interest and focus on, on autism past childhood and our research funders. And these are all different agencies, organizations that within the past five or six years have put out requests for proposals specifically on adulthood or a transition to adulthood for autism. When I first started in this field, trying to get grants, gosh, probably 15 years ago, it was really hard to get an adult grant funded. And I also was probably not that good of a grant writer at first. You know, we get better at these things over time. but. But you know, I had a lot of different organizations that told me it's just not really in our funding priorities right now. We're really interested in other things. And I've seen a real sea change in that over time, which has been really nice. And certainly, funding agencies are interested in understanding how to improve the adult experience for autistic adults. So why have we seen an increased focus on autism in adulthood? And there have been a couple of reasons. First of all, we're seeing more individuals who are getting autism diagnoses as children are being identified as autistic. And these children are exiting high school. They're getting older, they're leaving high school, they're entering the adult service system. And our adult service system is really underprepared to meet the needs uh, of adults in the system. Um, no matter where you live in the US, families talk about making the transition from school-based to adult services as falling off the cliff. Um, the size of that cliff may be a little different depending on where you are. In Tennessee, that cliff is pretty big. Uh, maybe it's not so tall in California. Um, but families have a really difficult time maintaining the services and supports they may have been getting you know, just a few months earlier and getting the right services and supports to, better, to best support their sons and daughters. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. One is that the adult service system is really significantly underfunded. We just don't have enough money in the system to meet the needs to really help, help individuals with disabilities in general really meet, meet their potential. The other is that it's really difficult to understand and navigate, and I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes. But, but one of the reasons why I think we see more interest and focus on autism and adulthood is because we're realizing that our formal service system isn't really cutting it <laughs> for adults on the autism spectrum. And at least partially as a result of that now, there have been a lot of studies out there that have shown that many autistic adults struggle in a lot of different areas. So studies that show that employment can be a real challenge for a lot of people on the autism spectrum. Um, not only getting a job, but being able to maintain that job once you get it, and, being, and, and potentially even being upwardly mobile in your employment career. Um, a lot of studies have found that mental health problems are a real challenge for a lot of autistic adults. Physical health problems across a number of different domains are, are higher for autistic adults than, than those who don't have autism. Um, getting into college and being successful in that college program is difficult. Social relationships are hard. And of course, difficulties in employment leads to challenges in financial independence. So not every individual on the autism spectrum, of course, struggles in all of these areas. And some people don't struggle in any of these areas. But these are sort of common challenges that we found across a lot of different studies. And over the last 10 years, there have been a lot of studies that have documented these challenges. And now I feel like the field is starting to move towards trying to understand 
what we do about it. <laughs> so we're starting to move past, like, let's not have one more study that documents that employment is hard, or one more study, but now how can we understand things a little bit more carefully in a little bit more nuanced way, and how do we understand things in a way that points us towards what we can do to help? I would also argue that when we think about adulthood, understanding what's happening and how to support individuals and families during the transition to adulthood is particularly important. Um, and there have been a handful of studies now that have shown that the transition to adulthood seems to be a real turning point for individuals and for families um, leaving high school and entering the adult service system. And this is just an example uh, of a study that, that I did with my, with my uh, postdoctoral mentor, Marsha Malik, gosh, <laughs> over 10 years ago now. Um, that makes me feel a little old. Um, but we looked to see, we had uh, data, it was a longitudinal study, so we had data collected over 10 years in the lives of a large sample of adolescents and adults on the autism spectrum. And we looked at behavior problems over time. And what we did is we looked to see how were behavior problems changing while the autistic adolescents and adults were in high school, and then how did leaving high school impact that change. Um, so these parts, of, so this line down the middle sort of delineates in our model exiting high school. So the lines to the, let's see, that's your left, shows uh, the change while they're in high school and then their change after high school exit. And what we found was that in terms of behavior problems, at least on the measures that we were using, we found that it, behavior problems were improving on average while the youth with autism were in high school. More so for those who didn't have an intellectual disability than those who did. Um, but that that improvement significantly slowed down after high school exit. Um, and that that seemed to be a real turning point for behavioral improvement. Now, probably, at least to some extent, due to challenges in services and supports, maybe due to sort of loss of structure that people get when they're in high school. But regardless, across multiple measures, we found that leaving high school was the sort of tangible turning point that we could see in our data, where improvements that we had been seeing across high school tend to slow down or even really stop. So this has led, at least for me, this finding and other findings like it have led me to really try to think through how can we understand and do rigorous research to understand how to improve the transition years, how to make that transition from school-based to adult services a little bit smoother for individuals on the autism spectrum and for their families. And when we think about how to improve outcomes, it's actually a really complicated thing to think about because when we're thinking about the autism spectrum, we're thinking about a super diverse group of individuals. The autism spectrum is so wide. Um, and so I think it's going to take a pretty big bucket of different services and supports and programs to be able to get the right services and supports to the people who are going to benefit most from them. But in general, I've taken sort of the ways that I think we can improve outcomes and put them into three really big, wide buckets. So the first is services, supports, programs that are focused on building skills in the individual. Now, a lot of our research is focused here. Things like building employment skills, for example, interviewing skills, building skills and adaptive behaviors, things like that. And I think that that is one important bucket of many that we can sort of work on building skills to really help support individuals to make a smoother transition. The second really big bucket, really big bucket, is, is services, supports, programs that are aimed at making changes in society and in the community. Um, I could probably break this down into six different legs of the bucket, but we'll just put it in one for now. So these, this is maybe like programming to make transition planning a little bit smoother, programming to make workplaces more accommodating, and even just sort of efforts that we might make to make our society more inclusive in general. And so, so I was thinking about that as sort of environment, but what I also wanted to pull out, because this is what I'm interested in, is the part of the environment that is the family. And what I'm hoping to convince you of today is that the family plays a really, really important role in supporting their sons and daughters during the transition to adulthood. And so understanding how to help families provide the support more effectively is one really important way that we can improve transition outcomes. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time uh, kind of in this next section of the talk talking about why we might wanna focus on families during the transition to adulthood. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done to try to understand how families influence the transition process. And then I'm going to move into talking about what we have been doing in our group to try to support families during the transition process, and specifically telling you about a randomized controlled trial, which is testing a services advocacy intervention. So the first way that families can um, support their sons and daughters during the transition to adulthood is really supporting their post-secondary activities. So to, to kind of look at this question and to understand this, this was the first study that I did 
at Vanderbilt. So this is a longitudinal study of adolescents, young adults on the autism spectrum. This was part of a career development award, a K award. And what I really wanted to do at this time, so this was back in maybe 2012, is understand when people on the autism spectrum leave high school, what do they do? <laughs> Where are they going? Because at the time, we didn't really know what are the range of different sort of activities that people are transitioning into, and what can we learn about people who seem to be transitioning effectively versus people who seem to be having challenges. It was a pretty small sample, but we dug really deep in terms of the data that we were getting from these guys, which is one of an advantage of having a small sample, right? And so we collected data from 38 families at three different time points. Everybody was in their last year of high school at the first time point of the study. At the second time point, people were about a year out of high school exit, and at the third, they were about two and a half years out of high school. And at each of these time points, we collected really, really careful, detailed information about how people were spending their days and how they had been spending them in between. Um, and, and, and pulled that information together to code youth into either having a disruption or not having a disruption. And we thought about how to code this really carefully. At first, we talked about sort of stability versus instability. But to be frank, instability is really common <laughs> during this time of the lifespan. And we see a lot of people, for example, that might be moving from a job where they're, make, where they're working 10 hours a week for lower pay to working, to, moving, to working at a job where they're making 20, hour, working 20 hours a week for higher pay. And we might think of that as instability, but really that might be more upward mobility or sort of something that we wouldn't want to necessarily characterize as, as something that might be challenging. People who are maybe moving from a two-year college to a four-year college, for example, would maybe be instability because the activities are different, but you know, maybe not something that we would, you know, we would particularly be worried about. So, so we took sort of a, a narrow view of instability by coding people who had a disruption versus didn't have a disruption. And disruptions were things like getting fired from a job, um, needing to leave a job under circumstances that were really difficult, like maybe issues with coworkers, um, dropping out of a college program because, for whatever reason, oftentimes because one wasn't getting the supports that they needed to be successful in that program. Um, and what we found was that over this two and a half year period in the small sample, Half of the youth, 50%, had had some sort of disruption over this time. So this is instability that kind of through our coding, we, it, it, it wasn't really reflecting upward mobility, let's say. And so then the next thing that we did is we looked to see from the factors that we had measured while they were in high school, so this is before any of the sort of disruption would have happened, what distinguishes people who experience a disruption versus people who don't? Um, and the first thing that we looked at or what I'll call the usual cast of characters. So there are a handful of variables, really characteristics of the individual that across a number of different studies have been related to how likely that person is to be employed. So if somebody has a higher IQ, they're more likely to be working. If they have autism symptoms that are less impairing, they're more likely to be working, or if they have higher daily living skills. But none of those factors distinguished between those who experienced a disruption and those who didn't. And instead, it was indicators of maternal mental health. So youth who had a disruption had mothers, mostly. We had a few fathers in the sample, but as these studies go, it was almost all mothers, um, who, when they were in high school, had higher depressive symptoms, higher anxiety symptoms, and lower levels of quality of life. And at first, that really perplexed us. And then as we thought about it more, it really seemed consistent with what we were seeing when families came into the lab. A lot of these families were working really hard to support their sons and daughters during this time. Like the formal services that they were getting, it just wasn't cutting it. It just wasn't enough to really support their sons and daughters. And I could tell you story after story, and you guys probably know stories too, of families that were really going to pretty extraordinary lengths to fill in the gaps when the services weren't cutting it. Families where the mother was moving to live in the same town where her son went to college, right? Or in lots and lots of other examples of this. And this led us to think that, you know, if the family is distressed, if the parents are distressed, they may not be able to provide that same level of support. And again, the formal service system is not coming in and filling in the gaps here. So, so, th so that's the way that we interpreted this data, is it really, I think, spoke to us and sort of reemphasized what we saw families doing already when they were coming into the lab, which, which, was, which was really putting in quite a lot of time and energy to really support their sons and daughters given that they weren't getting the services and supports to do that really otherwise. We also found that 
in terms of uh, in terms of why it is important to, to to support families and understand that the things that parents do to advocate for services and supports on behalf of their sons and daughters really matters in terms of the number of services that their sons and daughters are getting. And maybe that sounds like a really obvious thing to say, but there are a whole lot of barriers to getting services. And so one of the things that we wanted to understand is if families are doing a lot of things and getting out there, if they're attending webinars about services, talking to service providers, really working and doing all these things to try to get services and supports, how likely is that to actually translate into better services for their sons and daughters? And so we had data on 185 parents of transitioned aged youth on the autism spectrum. And there are a number of factors out there that we know are related to service access. If somebody has an intellectual disability, they're probably going to be eligible for more services. If their adaptive behavior is lower, if their autism symptoms are more severe, if they're still in high school, then they're going to be almost certainly eligible for more services and are getting more services at least. Um, and families who have lower incomes and who are from racial or ethnic minoritized groups also tend to be getting fewer services. So the first thing that we did in our regression model is we put all of those factors in there together, the known factors, to see how much variance in the number of services people were getting those factors accounted for. And they accounted for 17% of the variability in services. But the parent advocacy activities, the things that parents were doing to advocate for services and supports for their sons and daughters, accounted for another 14% of the variance on top of that. So almost as much variability as all of the other factors put together. So we found this hopeful, and we also found it a little frustrating when we got this finding. It's hopeful because it's telling us that the work that families are putting into getting services and supports seems to really be making a difference in terms of services and supports that their sons and daughters are getting. But the thing that I think was a little bit frustrating is whether or not people get appropriate services should not depend on how well their family is able to advocate for those services and supports. It felt like sort of another type of inequity that we were seeing in our research. But regardless of that, what this suggested to us is that supporting families may be a really important way at least to increase service access or to improve transition outcomes for youth on the autism spectrum. So to best support individuals, we need to support families. And I think it's also important to note, and again, this is a case in Tennessee and a lot of other places. I'm not sure if it's the case here, but oftentimes when youth with autism leave high school and enter the adult service system, it's really falling on the individual and their families to coordinate those services, to figure out services, to kind of put them all together, to coordinate it, oftentimes with little or no help. So we thought, okay, is there something that we can do to help make this a little bit, at least a little bit easier for families? which I'll be coming on in a minute because I've got the summary here, which is that the transition to adulthood can be difficult um, for individuals and for families, but parents do play an important role in supporting their autistic youth. They can provide some tangible support for pursuing adult services and for scaffolding post-school outcomes. Um, and also, and I didn't present the data in here today, but we have some other studies and studies from the lab in Wisconsin that show that families really play an important role in fostering environments for lifelong learning and development. And I was able to have, I think, a couple of really um, thought-provoking conversations today about thinking about development and developmental psychology and human development in the context of adulthood. And when somebody turns 18, they don't stop developing. They don't stop gaining skills and, and learning and growing. And when somebody turns 26 and they officially leave the transition years, quote unquote, or 35, people continue to develop and, and, and grow skills and, and really, I, I've seen actually a tremendous amount of growth in, in people anecdotally in their early to mid 30s in terms of things starting to come together for people on the autism spectrum. And families can really foster environments to help move that along, at least in early adulthood. Um, and again, supporting families is one of many avenues to improving transition outcomes, in addition to youth-focused interventions as well as interventions focused on the broader environment. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn to tell you some about um, our work and our trial working to support families during the transition to adulthood through developing and testing a services advocacy intervention. And I feel like we talked about this trial for so long and it took a long time to develop it and plan it and recruit and it. It's really exciting to be able to start to talk about what we're actually finding from it. So as I mentioned before, the adult service system is really tricky. <laughs> it's really hard for people to get what they need. Um, and again, one of the issues is that it's really underfunded, but that is one, I think, issue of, of one of two really important issues, because even if the adult service system was fully funded, I still am not sure that people would get what they need because it is incredibly, incredibly difficult to navigate and to understand. So there's really poor integration typically between school-based and adult services. 
Now, there have been a, there's been a little bit of headway made there. For, for example, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, Voc Rehab, needs to spend a portion of their dollars in school-based services and supports. And that's a good start, but I would say that's more of the exception than the rule. Oftentimes, families are transitioning from one service system to a completely different service system, and, and it's, it's really difficult. And also, Adult services are really poorly integrated between agencies. So you get income supports from this agency and job supports from here and supports for community living from here. And they're different agencies that don't talk to each other. <laughs> but the services are sort of interwoven and interdependent. There's gateway services. You have to get this to get this. If you get too much of this, you get less of this. And it is just incredibly difficult for families to understand and to navigate. And I'm going to kind of give you an example of how hard this can be. So this is actually a combination of, of two different families from our studies and some of their challenges. So I put it together to one to make it extra dramatic. But um, um, so let's say you have, you have a, an autistic son who's turning 26 and he's coming off of your insurance as a parent. So you need to figure out what is health insurance going to look like. And this is somebody who is on some medications that are working really well for them right now. So medication management is something that's really important to you. And you need to figure out how to get them health insurance. So you start asking around. You're kind of a fairly well-connected person. And what you, what you realize is that what's probably going to work out best for them is Medicaid health insurance. Um, this person is working, um, but not working enough hours to be able to get insurance through their employer. And so Medicaid health insurance is probably going to be the way to go here for you to be able to, to get them insured. So you get on the Medicaid website. And immediately, it gets really confusing. Because there are a lot of programs that are administered by Medicaid, like Medicaid waiver services for home-based, family community-based supports, Medicaid long-term services and supports, and Medicaid health insurance. So you dig around, you sort of get stuck here and there, and you finally get to where you want to go for Medicaid health insurance, which of course is called something different in your state. But you find it, and you get there, and you kind of, you get a feel for what you need. But then you keep talking, and you realize that the best way for your son to get Medicaid health insurance is for them to get SSI. And if they get SSI, income supports, then they'll automatically be eligible for Medicaid. Now, you're in a position with your family where you don't actually need the income supports. You're, you're fortunate for that. But you do need the SSI to be able to be eligible for the Medicaid. You have some concerns about working, what that's going to look like. If Will they have to cut back on the number of hours? What does this mean? But regardless, you sort of move forward. You try to figure that out. And you decide to research SSI. So now you get on the Social Security website. And now you're getting confused. There's SSI, there's SSDI. Some's based on work history, some isn't. And it's really difficult to figure out. But you wade your way through it. You apply for SSI. Now, you don't even really want the SSI, right? You want the Medicaid health insurance. But you apply for the SSI. And you say, OK, we're there. We've done it. We're getting close. So you wait for nine months. And then you find out that your application has been denied. Now, again, because you're a relatively well-connected person, you know that in the state that you live in, unless say it's Tennessee, two-thirds of SSI applications get denied the first time in. So you know that what you need to do is you need to hire an attorney and you need to file an appeal. Now, again, you don't even really want the SSI, but you need the health insurance. So you file the appeal. The appeal goes in, you wait another six months, and then the appeal is granted, and you get the SSI, which means now your son or daughter can get the Medicaid health insurance. So these are the things that families have to negotiate and work through to try to get something like health insurance. Now, the last point that I'm going to talk about is now you have to provide, find a provider who will take that Medicaid health insurance. And, it, you know, and that is an issue that I'm not going to touch on here much, except it's a really important issue that can be a real challenge for that. But anyway. The adult service system is really hard, is the point that I'm trying to make here. And families being able to understand how to navigate through that is a really, really complex barrier for many individuals. So in the meanwhile, we had, again, in the study that I was talking about where families were in their young adults with autism were in their last year of high school, we would talk with families and say, so, you know, your, your son's leaving high school in six months. Like, what are you going to do? What's going to happen? How do you, and they were like, we don't know. And they weren't getting information about services and supports to help make that transition. So um, we had a model that had been going on at Vanderbilt for quite a long time. And it, was, it started out with Bob Hodap, who's, who's in special education at Vanderbilt, and his former doc student, Megan Burke, called the VAP, the Volunteer Advocacy Project. And this was sort of a parent training, a parent intervention that was focused on teaching parents about their rights under special education law and helping them understand how to advocate for what services and supports their son or daughter might need under special education law. And we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could take this same model 
and make it about adult services and supports instead of school-based services and supports. So we received a pilot intervention grant from NIMH to be able to try to develop this and see if, given all of the barriers to services and supports, if getting families information in a digestible way really was enough to budge the needle a little bit in terms of service access. So in this grant, we, we developed a parent training to improve transition outcomes for youth by teaching parents about adult disability services and supports, how they interrelate, and the most effective ways to access them. Um, again, it was based on this program called the Volunteer Advocacy Project. Um, we had extensive, we could not have done this without extensive, extensive input from the community, the real experts in what families need to know about adult services and supports. Um, and, and the way that we set up the program is that we had a program facilitator. In our case, it was, it was a, a social worker who had years of experience running groups and, and working with families of individuals with disabilities who was sort of the face of the program. And then we brought in a local expert each week who really had boots on the ground expertise in the topic at hand. People who would know that for an SSI application, you need to not talk about like what your son or daughter can do. If you want to get it, you need to really think about how things are kind of on their worst day if you want to get SSI. You know, information that is sort of hard to hear and hard to, but is the kind of information that we need to know if we're going to try to actually be eligible and get these services and supports. And in Tennessee, I just have to say, we have the most incredible, dedicated, local disability community here. We had all kinds of providers, all kinds of people from government agencies that were very happy to sort of give up their time and their evenings to come and talk with our families in the program. And that's been the case throughout. I'm incredibly grateful to them. So just a little bit about our approach for the VAPT, which is carried forward in our work. So in this project, we focus in on parents as advocates. And that is something that we've continued to think a lot about, because what we would really like to do is think about how a program like this works for individuals to advocate for services and supports for themselves. But we know that right now, adult service systems are really, really hard. And there are people who would have a really difficult time advocating for themselves within the context of the services. And finally, it was parents who were the ones who were coming to us and saying, we are so frustrated and we don't know what to do. So to this point, we've been a lot of the work here, all of our work is really focused on parents as advocates. We're really thinking hard about how to take a program like this and make it work for people who are self-advocates. Given that the information is so dense and so complex and so difficult, how do we do this in a way that's actually meaningful for individuals? Um, instead of focusing in on one aspect of services and supports, we really try to help families put it together. So instead of focusing in on just employment or financial support, we talk about sort of secondary education policies, housing, financial support, post-secondary education, models of decision making, non-adversarial advocacy techniques, which is an important one for, for people to know, um, employment, special needs trust, uh, medical insurance, and we open each series with a session on person-centered thinking and spend a lot of time talking with parents about um, how do you really understand what your son and daughter's hopes and dreams are, what they would like, and then tailor the services that you're trying to go for around that. And finally, we have tried to make the program broadly applicable to families of youth across the autism spectrum. I was talking about this in one of the meetings uh, today earlier. This has been a really tricky thing, and we've tried to listen to community feedback throughout the course of developing this project. And we've gotten a lot of feedback from families of people who have really, really significant impairments, that some of these sessions don't feel relevant to them. And we've gotten some feedback from families of people who maybe their impairments, at least at that point in time, are sort of, or less impairment, or like, you know, they're, they're having, facing fewer challenges, who say, you know, some of these sessions aren't relevant for us either. But there's a whole group of people in the middle, right? And we've really thought hard about how can we, can we slice and dice this and, and give this session to these people and this session to these people. And every time we've tried to do this, we haven't been able to figure out where to slice and dice and where, who, who gets what. And, and, and the other thing is we also went through a, a phase where we were really trying to you know, let families pick which of the sessions seemed to be most relevant for them. But what we found is that there's a lot more that's relevant for more people than what people realize going into it. And also, needs can change over the course of years. So somebody might go into college, things might be going pretty well, and then there might be sort of a mental health crisis or things that happen. And now some of these services start to take on a little bit of a different flavor while families try to figure out what's next. So this is something that we're still kind of thinking through and, and, and struggling with and figuring out with the autism spectrum being so incredibly wide. 
how do we get the right information to, to the people who will benefit most? But at least for now, as we've developed this and thought through this, we've really tried to take as inclusive of a stance as we can and make this as broadly applicable as possible to youth across the spectrum, families of youth across the spectrum. So we developed the VAPT, and then we did a pilot randomized controlled trial. We recruited 45 families of youth with autism who were all within two years of leaving high school. Um, we did this in Tennessee, which is going to be important for, to come back to in just a minute. Um, we randomized participants to either the intervention group who got the VAPT right away, or a waitlist control group who got nothing right away, and then had the intervention a year later. Also really important that I'll come back to in just a moment. Um, and we had families who participated in person in Nashville, and then we webcast to groups in Memphis, Tennessee, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. And what we looked at is, does participating in the VAPT lead to improvements in parents' knowledge about adult services? How skilled and comfortable they felt advocating in their empowerment? And then ultimately, does that lead to improved service access? Um, and so what we found was that in this pilot study, yeah, participating in the VAPT did lead to improvements in knowledge, improvements in skills and comfort, and improvements in empowerment. Um, I have the Cohen's D up here, which is a little bit jargony, except to just say that anything above a 0.8 is what we, consider, we would consider to be a large effect size, something that we would expect that might be like clinically meaningful out in the real world. And all of our effect sizes were large. So we, found like, we felt like, OK, families were learning the things that we were teaching, which you know, is no, it's not a given, because um, it's a lot of really dense information. Um, and they're feeling like they can potentially use that information on behalf of their son or daughter. Then we also looked at whether participating in the VAPT uh, led to increases in number of services and in post-school activities. Um, and so we collected follow-up data uh, six months after our intervention group finished VAPT and then, and then 12 months after that, so another six months. So this is a, a six-month data here. Um, and what we found was that our intervention group who had taken the program on average, we're getting about one and a half more services at the six-month follow-up than they had been getting at baseline. And our control group was getting about a half more service on average. These are median, so kind of averages. Um, and thinking about this another way, um, just over 60% of our intervention group increased in the number of services compared to about a third of our control group. So, you know, small sample, but seemed promising. But maybe getting families information about services in a digestible way actually did budge the needle, at least a little bit. Um, and then we looked at post-school activities. Um, now, we didn't have very many people who were post-school here, so I think this is really important to factor. We had six people in our intervention group who had left high school, 10 in our control group, because we had thought at the time that getting families this information while their son or daughter was in high school would be a really important thing to do. So we really recruited heavily for people who were still in school, which meant that by our six-month follow-up, not very many of them had left high school. So these are really small samples, and that is really important to keep in mind. But even in this itty-bitty sample, it seemed to suggest that for families of people, for people whose families had taken the VAPT, they were more likely to be working in the community or in college than families of students who hadn't. So, so all very preliminary information, but to us it felt hopeful that perhaps getting families this information might actually budge the needle at least a little bit in terms of service access. But there were a number of challenges. So first of all, we developed this curriculum that we felt really excited about that reflected the adult service system in Tennessee. <laughs> because the adult service system is different in every state, and really the devil's in the details here with, with, with all of these services and supports and differences. So we actually um, developed sort of an off-the-shelf, full curriculum of presentation materials for 12 sessions, two and a half hours for each session, um, that worked in Tennessee. <laughs> So I would go and talk about it in other places, and, and you know, there would be people who would say, this could be an interesting thing for our families. Like, can we use it? And I would say, no, you can't. Because <laughs> it's not going to apply to your local context, right? And I think this is something that we needed to do because, to be frank, it took us a really long time to even wrap our head around the adult service system in Tennessee, much less trying to take a bigger view. But regardless, that was a real challenge with what we developed for the VAP team. We also realized that we needed a much more streamlined way to leverage the experience of our community experts. So as I mentioned, in each session, almost every session, we relied on somebody from the community, one of our partners from a local disability agency, who really knew the ins and outs of the information at hand to come in and talk with our families. So not only did they know the most up-to-date information, but then that was a resource, a contact person for our families to have when it was done. And what we had thought going into it was we wanted to be as um, least burdensome as possible for our local experts. 
So we developed the presentations and the materials for them to use, right? Two and a half hours of PowerPoint and, and, and activities and discussion. And then we handed over to our local experts and said, here you go, we did the work for you. Um, and as probably most people here in this room know, speaking off of somebody else's PowerPoints and slides and materials is really challenging. <laughs> and we had local experts who were wonderful and they were so accommodating and they were game for the whole thing. But it became pretty clear that if we let them speak about these things in the order and in the way and in the style that they were used to speaking, even if that meant that we had less control over the specific content, that that was going to be, I think, more effective for our families and way better for our local experts. So this was sort of our attempt to, to, to decrease the burden for them. But in fact, I think we kind of increased the burden by trying to ask them to speak off of, of our materials that we developed. And finally, as I alluded to before, the control group was a challenge. And I think the control group is a challenge for a lot of intervention studies. Um, but a weightless control group was maybe not the best way to go here. It, you know, it let, us, it let us compare participating in the VAPT to business as usual, right? Which for a lot of these families was not much. But we had a really easy time recruiting for these studies. Families came in because they wanted the information. And for our control group, we said, thank you so much. We're so grateful for your time. We're going to collect data from you for a year. And then you get to take the program and get the information. And again, I have to say, like our families, they were so understanding. And they were game. And they, they got it. But it still didn't feel great. And it led us to think that in the next iteration down the road, I think we need to rethink. So we were able to leverage this pilot work into an R01 from NIMH um, to really, I think, remedy a number of these different challenges and then to test out the new program in a larger randomized controlled trial. So the first thing that we needed to do was revise the curriculum to be nationally relevant. So how do we develop a program about adult services that are different in every state in a way that people can use across every state, right? Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about where we came to with that to try to figure that out. We also, at that point in time, we changed the name. So we realized as we were talking with our partners from other states that VAPT, Volunteer Advocacy Project Transition, people understood what that meant locally. No one understood what that meant outside of our local context. So we changed it to ASSIST, which was advocating for supports to improve service transitions. Um, and then in this, in this um, RCT, we're testing this out um, in, in, in in a randomized controlled trial in three different states, in Tennessee, in Illinois, and in Wisconsin. Um, in Illinois, Megan Burke is, is my partner there, who's in the Department of Special Education, University of Illinois. And then Leanne DeWalt at the Wasteman Center at the University of Wisconsin is our site PI there. We changed our control group this time around. So we actually gave our control group all of the written materials that our treatment group got. So our treatment group, as someone walks through ASSIST, our local experts provide all of the provide you know, PowerPoints, they provide handouts for their PowerPoints, a lot of different materials that families can put in a binder and then have with them when the program is done. So they don't have to remember everything. They don't have to take furious notes, but they just have to listen to somebody walk them through it, take notes that are meaning, and then they have the written materials at the end. So we gave our control group all of the same written materials on the same schedule. They just had to wait to have somebody walk them through the materials. Again, it was a lot of materials. It was pretty tense. So, but we wanted families to at least have a start and have some information. And then that let us test whether if you give families a big binder of information, which families can take that and run with it, and which families may benefit most from going through a 12-week program that walks them through it. Um, we also shifted up our eligibility criteria a little bit by focusing on parents of transition aged youth with autism both before and after high school exit. So in our pilot work, we really focused in on people who were still in high school because sort of our thinking going into this, and I think this is probably the thinking more generally, is getting families information about services and supports as early as possible is exactly what we should be doing because it helps them plan. It helps them know what to expect and to be ready. But we found that in reality, that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always so helpful. It was really hard sometimes for families to be able to anticipate what their son or daughter was going to need when they leave high school. Without them leaving high school and going into the adult world, it was hard for them to know sometimes where the challenges were going to lie for them and what to pay attention to and what to sort of put on the back burner for later. Um, we also found that needs changed a lot after high school. Sometimes a service wouldn't be needed for a while and then something would change and then it would be helpful. Um, 
And also, information about adult services changes. It changes all the time. Um, they revamped the Medicaid waiver in Tennessee you know, five years ago, and then we had to redo our whole curriculum because it was a completely different thing. So that's also a little bit of a danger in getting families information too early, is it might not actually be accurate by the time they would actually go about using it. But we're testing that. So we're recruiting families of people who are in high school and out of high school, and we'll be looking to see if there seems to be a time when getting families this information is more helpful than others. We really tried hard to do a better job of incorporating the perspective of the autistic youth into the development of our intervention and into our data collection. That was something that we did not do a very good job of in our pilot work. So we collect a lot of data from the autistic youth in the study so that we can look to see if families are using the information that they're getting in ways that move that son or daughter more towards their own goals. So not just are they getting more services, are they more likely to be working, but is it getting them closer to the things that they would like to do and the things that they would like to be. Um, and then the other big change is that we are, instead of, instead of delivering the intervention in the lab at the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, we partnered with community organizations who were delivering the intervention. And we did some coaching with them, but they really sort of took it and ran with it. So I think this just highlights a few of the things that I already said in the back T. Again, we had these PowerPoint presentations, a lot of content developed by our research team and then delivered by the social, the local subject matter experts. So for ASSIST, we had this challenge, again, of how do you deliver an intervention in a way that is at least somewhat standardized across different places where the specific information might be really different. And so what we did is we divided up the information into sort of nationally relevant information and then sort of local context information. And for each session, we developed a 10-minute introductory video that really introduced that session. What is SSI? What do you need to know about that? Why might that be an important thing for you to think about? Um, but the family story in each one that like taught was a family who was talking about kind of how this worked for them. A lot of times the family stories were talking about how the service worked well for them. Sometimes it wasn't. When we wanted to include family stories and where they talked about some of their struggles accessing the different services and supports because we know that many families are experiencing struggles and we didn't want to just have stories that are like, I worked really hard and this worked for me, right? Because that's not the reality for a lot of families. We were able to shorten it a little bit. I mean, man, it's just a lot. To try to walk families through what they need to know for each is a lot. But we were able to get from two and a half hours each week to two hours each week. And again, instead of delivering the intervention at the university, we delivered it in the community. And this is just a screenshot of our videos. Um, and we're going to put these up on the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center USAID website. The USAID helped support the development of these videos. But I think they ended up being really nice um, walkthroughs of sort of the basics of what you might need about things like, you need to know about like voc rehab or SSI or Medicaid waiver, like what are you waiving if it's a Medicaid waiver, things like that. That's just basic information for families to know. And the way that we set this up is our hosts for the videos are all families of autistic young adults who sort of have a conversation, kind of a question and answer about that session at hand. And, and it seemed to work fairly well. A lot of the families in our studies like these videos quite a lot. And then I also want to kind of come back to this. I would be remiss to not really make sure that I'm emphasizing the collaboration that was involved to develop a program like this. We relied really heavily on our colleagues who had expertise in adult services where I am at the Kennedy Center, but we also relied heavily on our colleagues at University of Illinois and at University of Wisconsin so we could make sure that we're trying to figure out what is the information that actually is nationally relevant, because it wasn't always the information that we thought it was that was actually the same across the different states. Um, and then we had a really, re really a sort of in-depth involvement from our partners at the Arc of Tennessee and the Autism Program of Illinois, who really helped us make sure that we were developing curriculum that, that was going to be meaningful to individuals and to families. OK, so project timeline and study design. So we recruited, across the three sites, 185 families of youth with autism. The youth were between the ages of 16 to 26. So we spent 2019 developing ASSIST, trying to figure out, again, going back to this, how do we do this in a way that, that is, works across different states, but also has some sort of standardization. Um, and then the end of 19, 2019 and the beginning of 2020, uh, we did our baseline data collection and then randomly assigned participants to either our intervention group or our control group that got all of the materials. And then starting in the spring of 2020, um, we started our uh, assist intervention groups. Now, as probably every study that people talk about now, has to talk about is the impact of COVID. 
here on, on our research. And our research was certainly heavily impacted by COVID-19. When we wrote this grant, we felt like one of the sort of one of the active ingredients, one of the pieces of the intervention that was so incredibly important was this in-person component of the intervention. Everybody knows where this is going when I say that, right? We saw families in our pilot work, a lot of families of the young adults that came into our studies were really pretty isolated from other families. They felt pretty alone in their experiences. They felt like they weren't doing it right and they didn't know how to do it better and they felt like they were the only ones who were experiencing that. And so to get together in a room with other families who are in the same boat and to say, oh my gosh, I, this is the same thing for us too. Like, what do you do about that? How do we figure that out? Was just really, felt very meaningful and felt very important. We had families who exchanged contact information and organized a pool party after the sessions were done. Families started coming early to the session, sometimes up to a half hour early to eat dinner and spend time together before the session started. So that means we had to come to the sessions a half hour early too, but that was fine. Um, but there was like this really lovely in-person component that felt like we were really meeting an important need of families in addition to sharing information. And so when I wrote the R01 grant, I really hit that hard, like this really needs to be in person. Sure, it would be nice to use technology, in and in, right? That's not going to meet the needs of these families. It must be in person. And then we were four weeks into our first two intervention group series when COVID-19 social distancing restrictions hit. So initially, I was like, well, the in-person is really important. So let's just pause it for a month, and then we'll get right back at it, right? <laughs> and, then, and then after a month, it became pretty clear that that wasn't going to be the case. So we just had no, no option but to move it online. And we worked really, really hard to try to facilitate that same type of experience. But we didn't, it just wasn't the same. Now, thankfully, sort of what we were really testing is sort of more of information giving, right? And sort of the family connection was a little bit of an added bonus. So, so you know, we, we were still able to run the group and families were still very happy with it. But, you know, it was different than how we intended it. And we're really trying to think hard now as we sort of write the treatment manual and figure things out down the road, how do we address that and talk about that? And I don't think I included it here in this talk. We did for the families that took, took the, part of the session in person and part of the session online. We asked them, like, how did it go both ways? What did you think? Whatever. And, and of the families that took it both ways, the majority of them, not everyone, but the majority of them preferred the in person to the online. The families who only took it online, we asked them, so if you could have taken it in person, would you have liked to do that? And they all said no. So, so I'm not sure how that factors in with things, but it's just something that we're thinking really hard about, and probably we all have to think in all of the programs that we're doing, how, how, how do we think about virtual versus in person. So just a little bit, really briefly, about our, our implementation outcomes. So one of the things that we weren't sure was going to work was, was our local experts, would our local experts actually cover the learning objectives that we asked them to cover? And lots of people have their own presentations and they have their own things that they're excited to come and talk about. And I totally understand that, I'm the same way. But if we say like these are the four things that we would like you to cover, how often does that actually happen in, in the course of the intervention? Which essentially is, is testing or asking, are people getting relatively the same types of information even if the specifics are a little different? And in general, we found pretty good coverage of our learning objectives. Uh, for, for health insurance, we had one local expert that presented lots of wonderful information to families, but none of it was the information that we asked them to provide. But outside of that specific case, we really found that, that for the most part, our local experts were able to sort of cover the information that we asked them to cover, meaning that families were getting roughly the same types of information, even if the specifics were a little different across the study sites. Um, we also wondered families, would families actually come? Would they be able to attend? The answer to that generally was yes. So about 80, over 85% of the participants came to at least three quarters of the sessions or more. So, so that we were, we were happy with that. Um, and when people weren't able to come, it was really a range of reasons that they gave us for that. Sometimes it was work. Sometimes it was family emergencies, a whole lot of others that didn't fit into any category. COVID happened from time to time, COVID-related issues, but that wasn't something that came up quite a lot. Um, so we've also collected data from both groups. We collected um, post-test data right after our treatment group, our intervention group finished the intervention. Then we collected data on service access six months after, 12 months after. And then our control group, those people who wanted to, had the option to take the full group-based session. Um, 
Now, some people chose not to because they were fine with the binder of materials and they were good to go with that. But we did have quite a few people that chose to take it. And we're continuing to collect follow-up data. But that's the phase that we're in right now. We're kind of at our six-month and 12-month data collection, too, because we also know that it can take quite a long time to translate knowledge into actually getting services and then to translate services into changes in the community. So we want to capture these long-term effects. Also, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because we're just starting to analyze the data, but I mean COVID, right? We're, we're measuring service access in post-school outcomes in the middle of a global pandemic when people aren't picking up the phone at the adult service agencies and a lot of people didn't feel comfortable going out in the community. So we wanted to really continue to collect data so we could say, see if there's some sort of delayed delayed response to intervention. But we had really nice, uh, we had a 95% retention rate in our post-test data. Um, and so in our post-test, that's when we looked our at our treatment targets again. So for families who took assist, did they know more about adult services? Did they feel more skilled and comfortable advocating? A and we found that, that the answer to that was yes. And this is, this is a manuscript that we have under review right now. But families who took assist knew more about adult services and they felt more skilled and comfortable using that information. So similar to our pilot work. We also wanted to start to look at moderating effects. So for whom do, does each of the different modalities of getting the information seem to work best for? And something that we were concerned about, or at least suspected, was that what we would see for assist would be kind of a rich get richer phenomenon where families that were already primed to advocate for their sons and daughters, families who are really well connected in, families who had resources, would take this information and run with it. Um, and actually, at least from some of, this, um, some of these moderators that we looked at, that wasn't the case. Um, and so we have, um, so you, if you look at the blue, the blue line, the aqua line represents our treatment group, the orange line, the control group, and you can see that the differences between treatment and control are, are bigger at the lower end of the knowledge scale at baseline and at the lower end of the advocacy skills. So families who are coming in with less knowledge about adult services and families who are coming in less skilled in advocating were the ones that seemed to benefit more from getting the 12-week program as opposed to getting the big binder of information. Which is not surprising, but we were, it, it was nice to know, and we'll keep testing this, but it was nice to know that perhaps this might be helpful for families that might need the most help advocating for services and supports. Um, and I'm gonna play this audio quote just to show that participants felt the program as well, but I'm actually going to play, play this quote for a different reason that I'll tell you about at the end here. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I would have no chance in the universe if I had not taken this as class. Like, this is class is saving our world, our, our family. Um, and now that I know about these things and, and know which agencies to contact and stuff, it's just frustrating when you can't get a person. Mm -hmm. So what she said, and I think the reason why I like this quote is because it shows sort of the promise but also the limitations of a program like this. So this was a mom who said, I'm so happy to get this information, but the frustrating thing is that we can't get somebody on the phone. <laughs> and so, it, it, and this was somebody who had been really trying hard to work on services and supports for their son or daughter given this new information that they had, and they couldn't get somebody on the phone from the service provider to be able to move forward with that. So, so I, I like to play that because I do think, you know, is this like, the final answer, is this the best way to improve services? No, I think we actually need to like revamp and overhaul the adult service system, to be honest. But in the absence of that, you know, I think giving families, arming families with the information to navigate the service system as it is, is maybe a reasonably decent backup. Um, so right now, we are just getting ready to turn over to the statisticians our data on service access and youth outcomes, which will let us start to test whether taking assist leads to better service access and youth outcomes. And let me tell you, measuring services is really hard. It's not hard if you have families kind of going through and just doing a checklist of yes or no for different services, but we did it in an interview format, which was, you know, maybe good, maybe not. But families would tell us things like, are you getting transportation? Well, yeah, we've been approved for transportation, but we're not using it right now because we don't feel comfortable riding the bus. And it's like, well, do you count that as transportation or do you not? Or we would ask about, like, are you getting the Medicaid waiver? And families would say, no, I'm not getting the Medicaid waiver. And then later on, they would say, oh, yeah, we're getting ECF choices, which is what Tennessee calls their Medicaid waiver. <laughs> right? And that makes sense because families, they know it. They know, the programs are branded pretty well, and they know it by the program. So it's really taken some post-processing to go back through that data and really try to get information that we feel confident about about not only the government programs that people 
are, are sort of accessing and working on, but whether that's actually leading to the direct services that those programs are supposed to fund, which doesn't always happen, especially with shortages in terms of direct service providers and things like that, getting approved for a government program does not necessarily lead to getting the service that that program would fund. So, so I've spent a tre tremendous amount of time going through that services data and we're just about ready to turn it over and analyze it. So we'll see what we see there. We're gonna be looking really hard to try to understand who seems to benefit most from each modality. Um, one group that we know did not benefit from assist were Spanish speaking Latinx families. We didn't deliver it in Spanish and we did not have very good luck recruiting Latinx families in general. So Megan Burke, who was a site PI on this project, has just gotten a new RO3 to take assist and to work really closely with a group of Spanish speaking Latinx families to try to understand how do we make a program like this more culturally responsive. So not just translating it and delivering it into Spanish, but what kinds of ways might we need to really revamp what we're doing to make this work for families in the Latinx community. She just found out about that, I think, last week, so we're pretty excited about that. And again, you know, knowing about adult services and having that information does not necessarily translate to getting that service. So what we really want to understand are where are the other pinch points in the process. If families understand and have information about adult services, what are the barriers to actually using that information to improve service outcomes? So in summary, families play a lot of important roles during the transition to adulthood. Um, supporting families may be one of, of a number of really important ways um, to help them better support their youth. Um, and there are promising programs that are available to support families. Um, we'll know more about our program and, and if it seems to work in terms of service access here in the next little bit. It'll be available regardless, but we'll, you know, we'll see what the evidence base looks like there, I'm hopeful. But there are other programs that are already out there that are evidence-based that are also, I think, have, have real potential to help support families. Uh, programs that are about reducing parental stress and psychoeducation to help parents understand the transition year. So I just wanted to mention those and, 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 and make a nod to some of the other um, family-focused evidence-based programs out there that have been tested in this age group. So Elizabeth Dykins at, at Vanderbilt um, tested a mindfulness-based stress reduction intervention, um, and she compared that to positive psychology um, among parents of children and adults with disabilities. Um, and what she found is that both of these interventions really were highly effective in reducing stress and distress in families. Um, Leanne DeWalt from University of Wisconsin has developed and tested a program called Transitioning Together, which is a group psychoeducational method that really aims at educating parents about the transition to adulthood. And I think the really beautiful part of this intervention is problem solving is a huge focus of this intervention. So families bring their challenges to the group and they talk through together, how do we get to the next step and how do we attack this in a way that's really effective? Um, and, and, and I think that that's a, a really lovely part of it. And what they found is that participating leads to improvements in understanding of service systems of the son or daughter with autism and improvements in family climate. So these are options for programs that are out there in the world that I think can be helpful if, if people are looking to support families. So just back to my stool, I think understanding how to improve transition outcomes is complicated. I don't think any single one program is going to work for people across the spectrum. So I think we, we need a real roadmap. We need a range, a menu of services and supports that we can really tailor and get them to the people who are gonna benefit from them the most. Okay, and I'd like to end by acknowledging, as, as probably most people here in this room know, any sort of research involves a huge team of collaborators, um, and I've had a lot of really, really wonderful ones on this work um, in terms of collaborators across Wisconsin, Illinois. Our um, community partners at the ARC Tennessee and the Autism Project have been, we couldn't have done this work without them. Lots of members of the lab, past and present, who have, have really been the ones that have gotten it done. Um, and our research funding and, of course, our research participants who put up with us and give us feedback and help make our work better in addition to giving us their time. Who are your local subject matter experts and how did you recruit them? So we worked really closely with our USED, um, but we, I mean, our, we're, so, we're so lucky in Nashville because our local disability community works really, really well together. So, so we had partners at the ARC of Tennessee who were our main, but we brought in, we actually had um, some local experts from some of the government agencies. We had somebody who came in and gave a beautiful presentation from Voc Rehab. Um, that tends to be really challenging in the past. A lot of people in, in, in our area, and maybe this is the case in a lot of 
are not very happy with the services that Voc Rehab provides. And in the past, we have stayed away from bringing in somebody from Voc Rehab because we didn't want it to turn into, you know, a lot of, you know, may, may have it be a difficult session. Um, but they're really, they brought in some wonderful people who are really working hard to make changes that acknowledge where the system has fallen short and where they want to go. Um, we have like our, our, our GD council, people from there have come in and spoken. Um, we have attorneys that specialize in, in, in special in, in disability law that have come in for a few sessions. Um, we, have a, we, have a, we have an organization called the Tennessee Disability Coalition that do a lot of sort of advocacy work and work with a lot of families that come in, people from the ARC come in. So we really kind of pull from, from our local disability community and our statewide disability community and really have gone through our, our USAID for the most part who really who are really well connected to all these different groups to help us identify who might be the people who will have the right information but also will be able to really connect mm -hmm. with families and provide the information in a way that will be meaningful to them. But that's one of the trickiest parts at the beginning of this is trying to figure out who those people are gonna be. We always have the hardest time with health insurance. Health insurance for whatever reason is always the session that we are struggling to find speakers for. And I'm not sure why but it's been the case across all of our sites and it's always the session that is the hardest to find local experts for. Yeah, I think I saw you had the lowest percentage yeah. on that one because they were all really high. That yeah. one was just a little lower. We've yeah. always struggled with that, even from our pilot work, for whatever reason, it's just, and maybe, maybe that's sort of as our, no, because it was a case in other sites too. I'm not sure why finding people to talk about that has been so hard, but it's also a long session for families because we talk about private insurance and Medicaid and Medicare, and I feel like families always walk out going, ah, but it's important, right? Thank you so much for yeah, really important uh, work and uh, great talk. A um, lot of interesting things to think about. Um, one that I'm curious about um, is uh, whether you uh, were um, able to, thinking about or able to do anything to sort of track if um, this was helping people stay away from any services that might actually turn out to be problematic for them, like I'm thinking of people who are on SSI and they're like, oh, actually, this thing of never having more than $2,000 in the bank account is kind of a problem. Maybe we shouldn't have done that, you know, that sort of thing. Anecdotally, yes. Um, I'm trying to think if we've, we collect, we, col we collect a lot of sort of qualitative data, or no, I wouldn't even call it qualitative, open-ended data from families about different things that were helpful or not helpful that we'll be looking at. Um, we also collect data from, from the autistic young adults about kind of what they would like for their lives and whether they feel like they're, these services that their families are working on, you know, or maybe working on, um, are getting them closer to that. So we're gonna be able to kind of get at that in like roundabout ways, but certainly anecdotally, we spend a lot of time sort of talking about income limits and how do you get around that and what are the different ways or like using special needs trust to be able to have for, for, for individuals to be able to have assets without that counting against income supports. And, and a lot of what we do is trying to dispel some myths that families come in with about kind of how things work and, and really help them understand where they might hit some pitfalls and how to avoid that. So that's really kind of baked into to what we do. And, and it'll be interesting as we start to really delve into some of our open-ended data, whether families are giving us some specific examples of like, I was going to do this, and then we decided not to and to move this way instead. You know, one place that we are actually starting to see that a little bit more is um, conservatorship versus supported decision-making, models of decision-making. And so what we're finding, um, and, we, and by the way, we try to be like, we, we really talk with our speakers to, buy, to try to be like, a little agnostic about this in their presentation because we have families that are coming in that already have applied for and gotten conservatorship of their son or daughter. So to come into the session and be like, you didn't have to do that. It was like really, it, that's, like, like that's not sort of the, the, the tack that we wanted to take. And for some families that is what they need to do, right? Um, and so we have had a lot of families when we kind of lay out the different options that you can, that you can sort of support your son or daughter, whether it's a supported decision making or power of attorney for health care or all the different things that they have found that to be really helpful and it's changed their thinking because what's happened and in some of our states more than others in our state is like when they're in high school, they don't get information about that many things but they do get information that you need to apply for conservatorship by the time your son or daughter turns 18 because if you don't, it's gonna be a real problem. Um, 
and, and so to be able to kind of speak to families about that a little bit and being like, in some cases, that may be true. And in other cases, it may not be. And even if you have conservatorship, you can still put things in place to really support your son or daughter in making decisions for themselves as much as possible is the one that families at least tell us that they've come away with that sort of really changes what they had thought maybe they were going to do going into it, if that makes sense. So, so again, we try to be, we've had, we've had local experts who have come in from time to time and have had um, really strong views on what families should do and shouldn't do. And we've tried to be really careful as time has gone on to, 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 try, to try to present the information in ways that are really respectful of families' journeys and where they're going while still making sure that they have as much information as possible to really think through and understand what their options are, even if they've already started processes that maybe they would have done things a little differently had they known what the options were. Um, I had a question uh, that's sort of related, and um, that is, um, have you thought or considered having the actual adults, the autistic adults themselves, attend the sessions? And is that OK if they're willing and able to, to attend? Um, just from a self-determination yes. perspective. Oh, we, we think about this all the time, and we try to figure this out. Um, conversations can get pretty candid sometimes. We have, in our pilot work, in our pilot work, we, um, we developed parallel sessions. Mm -hmm for mm -hmm. the young yeah. adults to do. And we actually, one of the sessions that we developed was we, uh, we talked about different, um, not models of decision making, different like person-centered techniques, like person-centered planning techniques with mm -hmm. the parents. We went through a person-centered planning technique with the, younger, with, the, with, with the young adults, like let's think about like what are your hopes and dreams or whatever. And then we brought the young adults and the parents together to talk about that. And it was an absolute disaster. Uh, <laughs> People argued, there were raised voices, and it made us realize like, it's because this isn't the first time that they've had these conversations, right? I mean, for their, the families are trying to figure out what's right for their son or daughter, and people are frustrated on both ends, and people aren't hearing each other, and to have these two different activities, and then to say, okay, come together and talk, and we'll, we'll, we'll help you figure this out together, I think was um, not, not as honoring as we would have liked about people's experiences and histories coming up. So we're really thinking about what are the different ways to, to, to move this beyond parents as advocates. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of different ideas for that. One I think is, is, is I'm really interested in thinking about how this might work, this program might work in sort of more of a service navigator model, mm -hmm. which would mean that navigators could work directly with the young adults right. to help them, or work with the parents, depending on the characteristics. It would just be more flexible for that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I, I, I've been having conversations with, with Carrie Shogren from Kansas, who's done a lot of work in self-determination, to figure out how we might sort of pull these side by side and run parallel programs where you have families who are kind of learning about how to advocate for specific services and supports at the same time that the young adults are really learning how to, to make decisions and effectively advocate for what they want in their lives and then maybe bringing that together down mm -hmm. the road. So we're really, we're really thinking through that. But I would say the program that we have right now, the information is so dense yeah. that it's gonna be, it would be helpful I think for, for some mm -hmm. autistic young adults and it's not gonna be helpful for a lot sure. of autistic young adults. So we're really thinking about how, how do we wanna shift and we've got some ideas for what that might look like. Cool, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. And one of the questions that uh, someone on Facebook raised was, um, how can parents best access the information they teach in the trial assist program? And is there an online option to do this program now? Now the answer is no, but I, but I hope there will be. So let me say what we will have online soon is the introductory videos. So kind of for families who wanna know more about like, well, what is SSI, what is Voc Rehab, what do we want to be thinking about for employment? These different things. We'll have those introductory videos available, and those will be freely available. For, and that information is relevant no matter where somebody lives. Um, but the thing that's really tricky about this program is you have to have somebody in your state who's willing to like pull it together and pull the local experts together and make it happen. So it would be hard for us to deliver a program in California because we don't. You know what I mean? So I think one, you know, we'll, we'll have. We're working right now on sort of thinking about packaging, thinking about dissemination, which is not in my set of skills. So I'm really trying to work really hard to figure out how do we 
make this as available as we can and not have barriers in the way for people to use it if they want to. Um, but what I can say we will disseminate very freely are these introductory videos, which I think are maybe helpful to at least help families narrow down what is this even? What, what do we even mean by models of decision making or person-centered planning techniques or you know, income supports or things and like that? And would they be relevant for people, um, not just autistic individuals, but people with other kinds of concerns? So that's the interesting thing too. So you know, everything that we're talking about basically in ASSIST is relevant to people, anybody who might be eligible for adult disability services. Um, so we had a, real, a really big discussion at the beginning of the intervention to say, do we just talk about disability, take the autism out, our family stories develop people with a, you know, have, bring in people with a wider range of disabilities. The funding was autism specific funding. And we talked with a handful of families before we, and families really wanted it to feel geared towards autism. autism. So our, a lot of our family stories are families of young adults with autism. Um, and, and, and we certainly use the word autism a lot through that. But to be frank, there is little, if anything, in the curriculum that is really specific to autism. It, the information about SSI is relevant no matter what. Voc right. rehab, you Same. know. So, 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 so we have to think through what to do about that, too. Do we kind of put that out in the world? Do we develop a parallel version that talks about we re record all our videos and develop a parallel version that, for people to have? I'm not sure. But it's certainly in all it's, your spare time. Yeah, I know. But it's certainly and all, all my spare dollars floating around. Yeah, right. But it certainly it certainly is relevant to people. It's, we've tested it only in autism. That was where our funding came from. But 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 it's relevant across disabilities. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, in we have the access program here, which is an adult focused yeah. program. And um, in some individuals that were diagnosed rather late, um, like high school or early college age. I find that there's a different process of yeah. self-advocacy and how to get services, also from the caretakers, parents, or social workers. Uh, did you see a difference in, in your group with that, too? Yes. We saw a pretty big difference. We had a handful of families who were, whose sons and daughters were fairly recently diagnosed, and they were really overwhelmed. <laughs> families who had sort of been in service systems for a little while, that sort of had a feel, that had been working with their schools for a while, seem to be able to kind of pick things up a little quicker and understand. But for families of individuals where they were kind of trying to make sense of things, it, it, it was pretty challenging. Again, this is why I'm maybe moving to more of a navigator model where people can kind of meet families where they are may be helpful. But, but that, was, that was something that we weren't necessarily anticipating or had thought through going into it, but it certainly where families were at on their journey in terms of how long their center daughter had had a diagnosis seems to really matter quite a lot in terms of how ready they were to really delve into all of this complicated and complex information. I find that helping families get services is the first step. Mm -hmm. And then the second step is helping get families to get services that are effective. That are what? That are effective. Yeah. And yeah. for example, like the partner rehabilitation, there's some research that, you know, that there's six to eight core services that actually advance employment outcomes for people with autism. And yet people with autism receive the fewest of those core services compared yeah. to other transition age youth. I'm just curious, so you know, if your, your project is getting families connected with the services, is there a continuation for the families as they continue into the services to get the effective services? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we're, we're following them and we'll look to see if services are related to actually changes in, in, in outcomes that we see in adulthood non-service related. But what you're bringing up is actually a really, really good point. We are working on a paper right now that basically talks about how hard it is to measure services in research in a way that is meaningful. Um, in that sort of getting measuring account of what people are getting. Are we getting three services versus five services? Is kind of maybe not getting the full story. Um, kind of benchmarking that against what somebody needs. Is somebody, do they say they need seven services and they're getting six versus they say they need, you know, that maybe gets us a little closer, but that's not quite there too. What about quality? What about number of hours? What about fit? What about the evidence-basedness? 
of the service and that if we're going to improve services, if we're going to make services better for people and more impactful, we need to figure out how to measure them in ways that we can actually capture that when it happens. So we've got a lot of open-ended questions in our work because there aren't really good measures to get at services beyond are you getting it or are you not? And to be frank, even accurately measuring whether you're getting it or whether you're not is really hard, um, given all the different variabilities in terms of people approved versus getting versus all of that. Um, but it's really, 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 really important and something that we're thinking about a lot in terms of if, if, if we're going to improve service access, then we should be thinking about whether people are getting what they need, whether it's effective. Um, and, and again, this is all helping to get the right things to the right people that are going to benefit the most. So it's super important, and we don't have an answer, but we're thinking a lot about it. One very uh, quick question following up on that. Uh, what about satisfaction? Uh huh. So we collect that. So we collect for every service that families get, we say, how happy are you with that service? Um, we don't see it. We see some variability. Families are generally not, even if they're getting a service, they're not like thrilled with it. They're usually not getting what they need. But we do. So that's, that is one thing that we measure. For every service, if they say they're getting it, we say, are you very happy, somewhat happy, not happy at all? Um, we also measure, if they're getting a service, we ask how much they pay, how much their family pays out of pocket for that, right? Because there are also services that people are paying for that they're getting as opposed to being funded through other places. So we're getting a lot of that information. We haven't, we'll look at over time, like even if the number of services stay the same, the satisfaction increase across the services. There are lots of different ways that we can kind of slice and dice and look at it, but I'm still not totally convinced we're getting the whole picture in terms of fit and making sure that, that people are getting, not just that people are getting services, but that people are getting the right services that are effective for them. So I think in the services research field, in, at least in disability, it's a real, real challenge that I don't think we've done a great job with yet. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.